I'm uh, Richard Norland, um, and I want to thank Brian, uh, Austin University, and, and University of St. Thomas for organizing this. I, I think it's a very topical uh, gathering, and as you heard just now from Frank, I mean, th these are some very uh, important issues that we're all looking at. Um, I thought maybe what I could contribute to the discussion is um, a little bit more uh, initially of the, the practitioner's perspective. I, I am a career diplomat. Um, Although right now I have the, the pleasure and the honor of, of being on the faculty at the National War College, I will be going back to the State Department in another, uh, another year or so. And uh, I will say I have renewed respect for, for the role of faculty, the people sitting on this side of the podium, rather than being a student. It's, it's a hard work uh, to stay a step ahead of the students. And uh, you know my hat's off to the academics in this room. But what I thought I could do was maybe try to trace how some of my postings over the last 20 or so years have reflected some of the phases of uh, transition that, that Frank has described, that, um, that Brian described in his presentation, give you a little bit more uh, maybe of a, of a feel uh, for how they were perceived at the time and, and what their significance might be. Um, I mean, for example, uh, I found myself in 1986 serving in Tromso, Norway, uh, 200 miles north of the Arctic Circle. We used to have a one-person post there. And you might ask yourself, what in the world was the United States doing with a one-person post 200 miles north of the Arctic Circle? A lot of people thought it was you know, spying and James Bond and all this. And the fact of the matter was, I was traveling around North Norway meeting mayors and newspaper editors and chambers of commerce and English language classes and basically showing the flag. Because the perception in Norway was that the Soviet Union could come and gobble up that part of Norway at any given time. Uh, the Cold War was still in pretty much full throttle, and our policy of containment uh, included little operations like this, show the flag, and, uh, and that is the situation that I found myself in, and, and actually it was our, our favorite tour in the Foreign Service. Um, a couple of years later, I, I found myself in Moscow, and here's a period when you can start to talk about collapse and disintegration. Um, you, could, you could tell that things were not healthy in the Soviet Union. Uh, you saw bread lines in the capital. Uh, infrastructure literally crumbling before your eyes and I remember coming back and talking to interested people in the intelligence community you know something is not quite right here this is just you don't see how this can all hold together but did anybody predict the fall of the Soviet Union of course not uh, except maybe leap I don't know if you guys uh, uh, but um, you know there was no understanding that that the you know things were in fact falling apart and, and of course we're lucky that Gorbachev didn't send in the tanks uh, on his people. He could have done that, but uh, ultimately uh, the Soviet Union broke up into 15 uh, independent countries. Uh, the wall fell, Germany was reunited, and this tremendous uh, shift in history uh, started to take place. Um, that, uh, and I, I, you know, I have to tell you, it was really something to observe that uh, at the time. Uh, that then unleashed a period of, of quite a, a bit of ethnic uh, turmoil as some of these frozen conflicts uh, thawed out. And whether it was in Nagorno-Karabakh or, uh, you know, in, in Georgia or other parts of the former Soviet Union, uh, things started to unravel. Uh, I had a chance to see some of that with a, a peacekeeping mission with the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Uh, some recommendations that uh, came up that were, were unfortunately not really uh, followed and, and uh, uh, that, that uh, diplomatic effort didn't I guess you could say in retrospect it could have gotten a lot worse, but certainly none of these uh, issues were resolved, and some of them still continue to fester today. But I had the chance serving in Dublin to look at one of these ethnic conflicts. It had nothing to do with the Cold War, but one where actually you were able to make progress, and where after decades and even centuries of strife, uh, the British and Irish governments um, were able to launch a process Senator Mitchell came in and helped to facilitate that process. And uh, you, you had the Good Friday Agreement signed in 1998, um, which uh, to this day, I mean, it's one of the few successful peace processes you can point to from the 90s. Uh, during this period, uh, there was a tremendous expectation that the United States would be uh, helping to lead the way towards restoring stability. Uh, but Brian mentioned the, the, the New World Order term that, that was floated very briefly after the Gulf War. Uh, by the Bush administration, uh, that phrase disappeared in about three weeks. Uh, I think because uh, a lot of Americans thought this meant some sort of new UN-dominated black helicopters, I don't know, but um, you know that, that didn't go anywhere. But 
uh, you did have an expectation that the United States was going to play a, a, an important role. When I was at the National Security Council, our embassy in, uh, in Portugal was on to us that the president of Portugal desperately wanted to talk to President Clinton, send in the Marines to East Timor, because that place had blown up in ethnic strife. Well, we weren't about to send the Marines into East Timor. We'd sent the Marines into Somalia. That didn't go well. Uh, we felt overextended. There was a sense in the United States that, you know, the Cold War was over. We should be able to turn and focus our attention on problems at home and get where was this peace dividend. The reality was the international system still required uh, some sort forms of, of occasional intervention, but we were not able to play uh, the role universally there. Um, again, in Ireland, that, that role did pay off. Um, and one of the set of factors that was at play there is, is what I'll, I'll refer to in sort of the next uh, phase, which you might call integration uh, and, and globalization. Uh, I, I was in Riga in 2003. Latvia uh, had regained its independence from the Soviet Union and um, desperately eager to join NATO and the European Union. And uh, these, uh, uh, especially the EU, representing a new form of integration where statehood meant less, uh, ethnic identity might mean less, uh, borders meant less. Uh, this was a huge factor in the Ireland peace process. Um, you know, uh, American companies and others had set up shop in Ireland thanks to globalization. Uh, you had, you know, with the EU becoming stronger, uh, you had people saying, well, why are we fighting about a border when borders are going away in Europe? And so these factors, these trends were very important in, in uh, at least in the Irish case. Um, but uh, the, the, the tendency was growing so strong in, the, in this past decade that, you know, at one point, uh, I know in the State Department, people were even saying, Do, why do we need bilateral embassies? Let's just have one big mission in Brussels. It'll, you know, half of it will handle the EU, the other half will handle NATO. Of course, I think we've walked away from that a little bit. There's an understanding that bilateral relations are still very important. But uh, this whole move towards integration has been a very uh, important factor in international relations. Uh, and, and of course, I don't need to say globalization has changed things too. Uh, you know, trade and investment creating enormous wealth, but also enormous uh, dislocation as jobs are, are moved uh, back and forth. Uh, the information age with uh, email and, and uh, social media, tremendously new tools, important new tools now in diplomacy, but you look at the WikiLeaks scandal and you realize there's a dark side to this uh, too. Um, the whole issue of cyber vulnerability in the modern age now, you look at the cyber attack on Estonia a couple of years ago. Um, you know, to what extent, I can tell you uh, from my engagement with military colleagues in Washington these days, uh, tremendous concern about social, the vulnerabilities of our economic system, our hospitals, our infrastructure to uh, cyber attack. And this is a whole new field. Um, also, uh, you know, in terms of, of uh, globalization, the rise of non-state actors, both for good, uh, things that the, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation can do in terms of spending millions of dollars on HIV AIDS, but also uh, elements like Al-Qaeda using uh, the tools of globalization for, for terrible ends. Um, and, and that kind of moves us to another phase here, which I, I'm sort of loosely talking about uh, relations with Islam. And uh, I had a chance to sort of some, get some insights into this being in Afghanistan and after 9-11. Of course, you're talking about divisions within Islam, who, who, who gets to define what it means uh, to be a Muslim, but also relations between the West and Islam. And how are we going to, you know, define that relationship? Um, you know, the the uh, situation in Afghanistan is still playing itself out, and and we can talk more about that later. Uh, but but now we've also seen the Arab Spring move into full march, and and of course there the the important thing from the U.S. perspective is is not that uh, that uh, we we should be helping or not. Of course we should be supporting and nurturing this kind of thing. But the bottom line is we don't own the Arab Spring. It's owned by the Arab and Muslim populations themselves, and, and we have to understand that and respect it. Uh, these are issues that NATO is grappling with, um, uh, Libya, the engagement there recently. Uh, but NATO, uh, just to mark your political calendar, has its next summit in Chicago this coming spring. And you know, Afghanistan, Libya, and who knows what's next. These are going to be very important issues on, on the NATO agenda then. Uh, and then finally, just again, not to make this so personalized, but I think that's my contribution. Uh, I was in Tashkent as ambassador to Uzbekistan from 2007 to 2010. 
And there, the, the penny really dropped with me about this kind of shift in the center, the global center of gravity from west to east. Um, you know, maybe it's because Central Asia is kind of the fulcrum of the world, and, and you can, you know, you could just see the Uzbeks and others looking from OSCE and the EU and NATO, and how can we nurture our relationship with Europe and the West? The saying, you know what, we get a little too much lecturing from Europe and the West on human rights, and we get, you know. We're not getting the lines of credit that we want. China, on the other hand here, is ready to you know, shovel in as much money as we can use. Um, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the Asian Development Bank, uh, you, know, you could just see the shift in uh, attention uh, going to the, to, to the east. And of course, this is very important for the United States because, uh, and for Europe, because I, I think um, you know, this <coughs> Central Asia and South Asia is where you, the tectonic plates meet. You know, China, Russia, Europe, and uh, the United States still has interest there. And uh, if there's anything that's tricky about the Afghan situation now, is that Afghanistan is our foothold in that region. And if we, even as we talk about, uh, you know, modifying our presence there, we have to be careful not to abandon this region entirely because this is going to be a tremendously important region looking ahead as, you, as this shift from west to east uh, continues. So in short, um, tremendous shifts over the last couple of decades. Uh, they're still playing themselves out in terms of globalization. Uh, the the you know, more nation states, you've got South Sudan, uh, but they, the, you know, the borders maybe mean less and you have more uh, influential non-state actors. Uh, a constant in the form of the, the continuing interest and, and spread of, of freedom and self-determination and the desire for that and this shift to the east. Um, international institutions, their ability to cope with these changes is, is a, you know, tremendously uh, under pressure now. The, the, uh, the, the institutions that were created after World War II, the UN, NATO, the IMF, the World Bank, uh, the European Union, uh, these are all uh, struggling to be relevant and to uh, cope with this change. New organizations are being formed. ASEAN, uh, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the Organization of the Islamic Conference, um, the African Union. The question is what will be the role for these institutions looking ahead? And meanwhile, while that's all sorting itself out, the, the basic mechanism for dealing with international challenges is essentially the coalition of the willing. Whether it's the G8 or the G20, it's ad hoc. Um, and uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, we're muddling through, I guess is the best you can say for it at the moment. In all of this, I think a constant has been uh, the U.S.-European relationship, uh, working as partners, uh, operating on basically a, a similar set of uh, values uh, rooted in democracy and, and really rooted in the moral uh, concept that, uh, you know, we're wealthy countries and we owe it to others who are less well off to try to uh, create a sense of stability and a sense of uh, opportunity. Uh, but even in the United States and in Europe, things are changing and, and decisions are, are yet to be made. Uh, in the United States, we've traditionally alternated between isolationism and internationalism. Some people were, think we're entering a period of isolationism now. Uh, if not, if, if we're going to remain internationalist, what kind of internationalist? You've got the, the uh, Wilsonian idealists and the, the Teddy Roosevelt realists. You know, we're going to have to figure out how we're going to play this and we're going to have to do it on the back of a, of a very seriously uh, challenged economy. And uh, you know, no doubt about it, how the United States is perceived in the world and our ability to uh, uh, influence developments in the world is very much a factor of our uh, economic situation. Uh, you have uh, very respected uh, people in uh, uh, leaders and former leaders saying you know, the, the single biggest challenge to the United States now in terms of national security policy is our economy. Um, so that's something we've got to work on. Europe, of course, is facing its own challenges with the, the euro right now, but also questions of, you know, to what extent has EU enlargement been at the cost of EU uh, depth, the deepening and integration? What does it mean to be a European? Can you be a, a Muslim and a European, uh, an Arab and a European? Can Turkey be part of the EU? And these are issues that the Europeans themselves are also uh, grappling with. Um, Obviously, everybody gets to decide for themselves, but um, I think the important thing is that the U.S.-European dialogue uh, continued to, to be strong. You know, despite the age of email, uh, I absolutely uh, think that uh, there's no substitute for personal engagement. There, there's almost a risk now of people kind of going their own ways because of modern technology, not really getting in there and seeing things for themselves. 
you know, you, you see stuff like this, this Time Magazine article from August 22nd, you know, the cover, Decline and Fall of Europe and maybe the West. And I, you know, I, I think that's a little extreme. I, I don't subscribe to that. Um, but I, I do think we, we face some, some serious challenges. Um, you know, as, as Frank said, uh, this is a crisis of sorts, but not everybody sees it as a crisis. We have to be careful not to get into crisis fatigue uh, because, you know, there's such a thing as an existential crisis. And for a lot of people, you know, who are trying to put bread on the table or get themselves out of a war, that's a serious crisis. We're fortunate in the sense that, um, that we're, we're still doing okay, but there are some serious issues we have to grapple with looking ahead. And as for me, the barometer of, of U.S.-European relations will, will come out in December when the Steven Spielberg Tintin movie is uh, released and how that's received in the U.S. and in Europe, I think, will, uh, will be the ultimate measure of, of the health of this relationship. Thank you.